Dr. Hartman, welcome to the program, sir. Well, thank you, and uh, thank you for having me on your show. Yes, sir. Glad that uh, glad that you're with us. Um, first of all, tell us a little bit about your book. What is this? What what, what are you hoping to accomplish uh, in this book, Jesus and Co? Well, I hope, what I hope to do is um, create a bridge between the world of theology and the business world, and I think that it's been long, long overlooked that you can use the lessons of Jesus and the Gospels um, in your work life, and not only survive but thrive while swimming with the sharks that is uh that is extremely interesting because i think a lot of people would say you know if you if you read scripture and you know it talks about the idea of loving your neighbor as yourself some people might say well if you love your neighbor and yourself your neighbor will stab you in the back and take all your money uh but you're saying that's not the case no i don't believe that's the case i really think that 95 percent of americans when they get up in the morning that's not their intent. Their intent is to have a good day, to be uh, to be able to pay their bills, and to be able to pay their bills ethically through the money that they earn. And I think most Americans, well, statistically say most Americans want to have a positive relationship with God. Huh. Yeah, I mean, uh, I, uh, I certainly hope that to be true. Um, so in today's business world, you talk about, I, I love what you just said there, uh, bridging the gap, you know, between uh, theology and the way things uh, you know, work today in, in the business world. I think we certainly need more of that. Um, so what, what kind of, did, was there something in your own life that maybe inspired you to, to write this book? Well, yes, it was. I, I left the business world uh, in 2010, and, uh, you know, I've been a successful CFO for Fortune 500 companies. Uh, but I really felt like I needed a deeper connection with God and Jesus and have that relationship. So I left the world um, at, at, you know, not a not necessarily the best time. Uh, I was doing well. And I entered into theological school. And while I was in theological school, I kept hearing this voice that business is bad. And that wasn't my experience. And I was fortunately able to work with a lot of wonderful people and I do think that's representative of how most Americans are, that they're just terrific people that want to do a good job. So as I kept hearing these voices, I determined that it was just fashionable to say that business was sinful. Um, but the reality is, as I would point out to my classmates, is that 95% of Americans are going to have to work. Not, not all Americans named Rockefeller or Kennedy get the, get the freedom of not having to work. So we all have bills. We're all going to have to pay our bills, and we all want a relationship with God. And I think we need, as a country, to respect that, both in the academic world and in the church world and in the business world. And, you know, so I was inspired throughout my seven years of getting my doctorate degree to constantly try to show that the business world is not as bad as, as we think it is. You're saying that when you're in, uh, you're in theology school— you say you're hearing voices. You, when you say that, you're meaning like your other classmates, right? Yeah. Okay. Definitely my other. All right. I, I'm just making sure. I'm just making sure. I, I, um, oh right. So okay, when yeah. you when you yeah. said it when you said it was uh, uh, fashionable, talk about that because um, you know I I've read some stories here of late how uh, there are some there are some people who are maybe. Uh, you know, theologians that maybe try to drift into in some in some instances, not all uh, cultural Marxism, and uh, they'll 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 use words like social justice, and they're not necessarily explaining that gospel social justice is is different than way the way the leftist culture means social justice today. Can you talk about that? Yeah, I couldn't agree with you more. I think that there is um, as there is in every. Uh, industry in every walk of life. There are those things that are fashionable to say. It's what you think the crowd wants to hear. But what the crowd wants to hear is different than saying what you really think. Uh, we should never do anything, whether it's in the academic world, the theological world, the business world, just to satisfy ourselves that we're getting successful because we're saying what people want to hear. And I think that the test of the true gospel is saying what you think is right and what you think is good, but not based on what you think others want to hear. And it has become fashionable to talk about business as sinful, but it isn't true. Well, and really it's just what, what you're saying is 
where you were at this uh, theology school, they were basically saying capitalism uh, is evil. Now, I would imagine some of uh, your your friends, your colleagues there would say, well, capitalism is evil because it's based on greed. But isn't socialism based on greed? Oh, definitely. So, it, it's both are forms of power and how you get power. And it's what you do with the power that's really the issue. Um, are you using it to manipulate or are you using it to make the world better? And capitalism has proven to be a far more successful form of um, economics than socialism in terms of making the world better. Hmm. Well, so it seems to me that's why you wrote the book. I mean, G- Jesus and Co. Connecting the Lessons of the Gospel with Today's Business World. I mean, if you were surrounded by people who were saying uh, business, you know, it's it's uh, it's sinful or it's not good, and you were saying, well, no, not not, not according to my experience. Um, and and yeah. my my fe- my fear is is that there are more people out there uh, that have this line of thought, and it's it's growing. Yeah, it's, it's definitely growing, and that's in part what the, the book is fighting against. You know, I, I knew a, a gentleman who uh, worked for the Wall Street Journal for many years, and uh, he got frustrated with uh, how the rest of the world was thinking about America and about faith. And what he did is he actually quit his job, and he went into the Peace Corps and served in Africa to prove that Americans are good. And, you know, that's more so that's more symbolic of what I saw. That type of attitude by the business people that I worked with about doing good. Sure, there's Bernie Madoffs, and sure there are, you see something like this morning, the Nissan uh, CEO got fired for for greed and uh, malfeasance. But they represent a very small group of people that work in the business world. Your average person, and if your uh, listeners think about it, they think good about themselves. And that's, I think, a more accurate reflection of the business world than what we read in the newspaper. Yeah. yeah, not to mention the jobs that are created by these small business owners that, you know, had an idea, went out, risked everything, and now they're, you know, supporting not just uh, individuals but also the families connected with those employees. Uh, and it really is it's, it, it is uh, really a, a great uh, way to build an economy and, and, and you know, voluntary cooperation, you know. And that, that's the one thing, you know, I, I, can't, I, could, I couldn't possibly understand, you know, people who, who are studying theology that, that want a system that's based on, on force, um, an economic system that's based on force, because that fundamentally is de- depriving you of uh, individual rights in the end. Eventually it does. And, you know, one of the, one of the main reasons, and, and we're talking with Dr. Bruce Hartman, feel free to disagree with me, Bruce, but one of the main reasons that uh, we fought the Revolutionary War was because you had theologians, you had preachers who were saying, you know, uh, we're all going to stand individually before God, and we have to uh, take account. And uh, you know, the righteousness of Je- Jesus is is imputed to us if if you're a Christian, and that's what you know appeases the wrath of God. And all men are doing that, even the king, even the king uh, that they were supposed to be loyal to, and that got people thinking, huh? Well, if that's the way things are going to be in the end, then why does this person? because of his bloodline, get to, you know, uh, uh, exercise all of this authority on, over me now. And and that little line of thought, um, you know, kind of spread, and it got people to say, you know what, I don't, I think we're just going to say no, and, and, and we're going to fight this war. Um, you know, that that's why we are here today in, in many respects, because of what the Founding Fathers uh, did, because of those conclusions that they that they came to. Well, what are you, how do you respond to that? Well, first of all, it's, you've just given a wonderful description of the reason behind uh, the American Revolution and the creation of the Constitution, which gives us all our rights. But they, the proof is in the pudding. America is the longest and oldest form of pure democracy in the world, including nations in Europe and throughout the world. We are the ones who set the symbol of freedom for the rest of the world through the Constitution. And we, all, we owe a great deal of thanks to Washington, Jefferson, and John Adams in, in particular, but also to the members of the Continental Congress who risked their lives to set this country up, to have these freedoms. Um, we're talking to you with Dr. Bruce Hartman. Now, now Bruce, I want to get into some current events here. I got this Washington Post story uh, about Nancy Pelosi. What are you hearing? Uh, I've got the Washington Post story. Uh, I got one from like 21 hours ago from CNN. Showdown looms over Nancy Pelosi's bid for speaker. You think she's going to have enough Democrat votes? 
Well, I, I think that personally we should never have any person in leadership for more than two terms. And, in fact, I could stretch that to both the Senate and the Congress, that you should only be allowed to serve two terms. Because what, what's at risk is this demagogue um, attitude that we end up with. Um, and I, I do, frankly can't see what Nancy Pelosi has accomplished that's positive. Yeah. Uh, well, other I mean, than divisive. <laughs> Well, she's she's done a lot for Republicans. I think I think a, a lot of the, the kind of, you know I think a lot of people voted for Republicans uh, back in 2010 because of her. Uh, yeah, she's a very polarizing, uh, she's a very polarizing personality. And what's interesting is within the Democratic Party, there's some real patriots and people that really care about our country, and their voices aren't being heard. And when when you look at successful. Uh, organizations that provide service, whether it's your local EMT squad or um, others, other civic ventures, the really good ones limit how long people can stay in power. The reason is to prevent exactly what's happened to the Democratic Party. So a lot of people say that she will eventually get the votes uh, because she herself raised so much money uh, and, and she helped secure the Democrat takeover of the House in the midterms. Yeah, and that, that in itself threatens our democracy. Uh, when money can get votes, uh, we're in trouble. Huh. I mean, I, I would agree with you. Now, you, you just said earlier, uh, you know, this is what's happened to the Democrat Party. Um, you know, expand on that. What What do you think has happened to the Democrat Party? I was just quoting last hour, Sebastian Gorka was recently interviewed, and he was saying, look, John F. Kennedy would not be allowed in the Democrat Party today. Um, no. React, no, react no. to that, please. Now, first of all, John, John Kennedy, he was an interesting politician. As, uh, you know, both he and Ronald Reagan are considered to be the best communicators of mm-hmm. our generation. And what's interesting, when you listen to Kennedy, he always talks about both sides. It's, he's so very careful that he keeps agenda out of his, out of his speech. And, and Reagan was the same way. And that's the type of leadership that we should have. Um, but you are right that when I when I watch YouTube videos of some of Kennedy's speeches, the one thing I do notice is lack of agenda. But also, I say to myself, there's no way that this guy today could become would be a Democrat. In fact, he'd probably be considered a moderate Republican. Well, so so why? I mean, what has happened to the Democrat Party then, in your opinion? It, I think it goes back to saying what's fashionable, um, and it's. Um, the, the issue is it's become what I call, and I, I don't mean to defame Yale, but I, I call it Yale elitism. Um, the Democratic Party no longer thinks about the brewer in Milwaukee, what his life is like, what he and his wife and his two children have to go through each day to make ends meet. Uh, many American families now cannot afford health care, uh, but they could have before. Uh, even 10 or 15 years ago could afford health care. Their, their taxes are going up, not just um, in terms of the federal tax reduction, but state taxes are going up. Um, and the city of Portland, Maine, they just recently introduced a roof tax, which uh, is interesting. You're getting taxed about because of the size of your roof because it's creating water flow onto the ground up through rain. Now, you think about a person that's making $60,000 a year, a family that's bringing in $60,000 a year, and now they have another $2,000 bill to pay. That's not the Democratic Party that, uh, of past generations. They would think about that individual, think about the, the poor working family that's trying to make ends meet. That's not happening today. Yeah, I, I got to. To me, it seems like, you know, well, is that sixty thousand dollar? Is that a white family? Uh, well, they're 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 okay. You know, they'll, they'll be fine. I mean, that, that seems to be what kind of where it's going. And, and you know, you talk about they don't think about the Milwaukee, you know, the guy working at the br- the brewery in Milwaukee. Isn't that why? Donald Trump won Pennsylvania and Wisconsin in, state, in states like that, in your opinion? Oh, definitely in, uh, definitely an opinion. And, and it's further, you, you take that man or woman, whether they are white or black or Native American or Asian, and what we did as a Democratic Party is we called these people deplorable because they didn't have a college degree. Well, a college degree doesn't, in, doesn't endow you with extra intelligence. Yeah. Right. So I've met a lot of uh, high school graduates that just are just as wise or probably wiser than me. Um, and I think that that 
that's a barrier that people, I think, have lost respect for, exactly how hard most Americans have to work just to get by every day. Mm-hmm. Yeah, Yale elitism. I, I like how you say that. And I, and I would also add, um, I, I think you do have these – uh, you know, these liberal enclaves, uh, uh, you know, and, and you've got these Democrats that want to get reelected. And I think the more and more the, the constituency gets further and further to the left, there's also the tendency to say, you know, I want to keep my political power. So a- instead of maybe saying, mm, you know, going maybe towards the middle and saying, you know, I don't think it's right that we burn campuses down because Ben Shapiro is, is going to speak at Berkeley. Um, instead, you get the Maxine Waters situation where it's pretty much accepted that she says if you see somebody of the, of the Trump, you know, administration or, or the cabinet, form a crowd, you know, and go up. And, you know, that's just a recipe for disaster. Um, I know I know I know you don't like President Trump. I know, you know, I know the, the left doesn't like him, but but there's there's other ways to have political disagreements than than what we've seen lately. Yeah, then there's, there's a, my, when I was a young man and my dad was teaching me uh, the lessons of life, one of his favorite things to tell me was, Bruce, gasoline never put out a fire. So when I hear Maxine Waters um, telling restaurants not to serve Sarah, Sarah Huckabee or we should get violent, that, that's not going to solve anything other than polarize the person you're trying to change. Mm. And I- if we truly want to have open discourse, it has to be civil. On both sides. I agree with that. Yep, civil discourse. Dr. Bruce Hartman, author of the book Jesus and Co. Connecting the Lessons of the Gospel with Today's Business World. Check it out, folks. And Dr. Hartman, it was great to have you on. Great to meet you, sir.